Once upon a time, in a land not so far away, there was a boy named Stephen Trescott, and witnesses saw him cycling away. The day was June 9, 1959. He wasn't alone. He had Lynn Harper by his side. She was riding on the front of his bike, and exactly two days later, there was a homicide. Lynn's remains were found in a wooded groove near the town. Suspicions began to arose on Trescott, and his whole world came tumbling down. Trescott claiming he was giving the girl a lift to the highway, hitching a ride to her grandma's like any other day. A series of terrible events untangled. Twelve-year-old Lynn was raped and strangled. The small town of Clint was surprised and bewildered. Who could possibly be Lynn's killer? A fourteen-year-old Trescott was immediately to be blamed. Police arresting him, stating, He's guilty, they proclaimed. Going straight to trial for a crime not done, denied of bail, tried as an adult, and eventually being sentenced as the youngest death row inmate for a trial not won. Spending four months in the shadows of the gallows, supposedly to be hung, which still be shadows, given a sentence of life and imprisonment with eligible parole in ten years, never having the chance to finish school or pursue any careers. Ten years was up, and Trescott was eligible for parole. He moved to Guelph and took on a whole new role. Changing his name to Stephen Bowers, being employed as a millwright worker, marrying, starting a family of three, desperately trying to start his life over. That was then, and this is now. We open up with a story with loads to tell. Hey, kids. Hey, Dad. How was work? Remember when you've been asking about my criminal past? Well, I've got a story for you. Here's the video. Oh, you thought we were done. That was just volume one, and our story has just begun. The entire trial was based on that Lynn wasn't the type of person to hitchhike. That's right. Let's watch this video on his dubious fight. There were multiple reasons why Stephen was considered to be a suspect, although none of them provide any justice. When Truscott was questioned by the police, he made inconsistent statements. He had abrasions and lesions on his penis, causing the police to think he was sexually active. Although recent doctors that studied this case said that the lesions on his penis wouldn't be, would not be the result of rape. Also, when Trescott was in jail, a doctor went to check out the lesions and said that he had them, but no injury on his penis indicated any sexual activity. This report from the doctor wasn't included in the trial. In addition, the police were also wondering why Stephen didn't tell them that he saw Lynn enter a Chevrolet at the spot where he left her. On the bike trail near the body site, there were bike tracks, which the police assumed belonged to Stephen's bike, although these were bicycle tracks that were there a week before the murder, making it useless evidence in the case. Now, Stephen is an innocent man for many reasons. His defense lawyer said that Stephen dropped her off 100 meters away from the body site, making it unlikely for him to have taken her that far to kill her. Also, two kids playing under the bridge that Stephen Trescott crossed with Lynn said that they saw him cross over the bridge to drop off Lynn, and then he crossed over again on his way back without Lynn. During his trial, a pathologist's autopsy report of Lynn's body was used, and this report made Stephen an official criminal, according to the courts. The autopsy concluded that Lynn's half-digested stomach contents reveals that Lynn had died between 7.15 p.m. and 7.45 p.m. Unfortunately, Trescott was with her during that time. This was all wrong, though, because during the case study, the police got an update on the autopsy in a letter where the pathologist states that he is sorry for giving such a narrow time frame for Lynn's death. The police never used this letter in the trial as a piece of evidence. Also, Current pathologists re-examined the autopsy and found that the time frame was inaccurate and the pathologists used no proper method to even get a proper time frame. In addition, the court used the kids in the town as eyewitnesses. This was such a risky thing to do since kids tend to get confused and sometimes don't know what they're talking about, especially at such a young age. One of Stephen's classmates claimed that she was supposed to meet Stephen in the bush, where Lynn's body was found later on, to do some naughty things. Stephen claims that he never made that agreement with her. Also, a friend of his at the time was spreading rumors to the other schoolboys that he was going to meet Lynn in the bush and do some naughty things. This was a joke made by Stephen's friend at first, but then when the police started getting involved and questioning them, it was no longer a joke and the police took it in as hard piece of evidence. 
1966, while Stephen was still in jail, a woman named Isabel Le Bourdet stirred up a controversy after reviewing his case. She believes that the police reports were inaccurate, the evidence gathered from investigators was improperly analyzed, and she was weary about the children's testimonies used by the Crown. Even though Stephen Truscott was, relieved, was released after 10 years, the Association in Defense of the Wrongfully Convicted cleared all of Truscott's charges and cleared his name. They dug into the case and found 3,000 pages of material not disclosed to the defense in his trials during the 1960s. They also found a 700-page brief that showed inadequately investigated evidence. Some of this evidence confirmed that some kids saw Lynn dropped off at the highway and that an old couple also saw her hitchhiking. All this evidence was crucial and used in the trial later opened up again years and years after Stephen's release. The Court of Appeal cleared all of his charges after hearing this new evidence. Eventually, a new suspect came into light named Alexander Kalachuk, who was an Air Force sergeant that used to work in the town of Clinton. He was arrested three weeks prior to Lynn's death for attempting to lure a girl into his car. In the end, Stephen was awarded $6.5 million in compensation from the Government of Ontario. Using that money, he launched a program at the University of Guelph and gave scholarships to two students in his program. We believe the criminal justice system needs to have police investigators get special training on their job and should be instructed to use all the evidence they have in their case. In Trescott's case, crucial evidence was not included in the court hearings, which was one of the reasons for his wrongful conviction. Now we understand that back in the 1960s, pathologists didn't have the greatest technology for autopsies, although they did just have about everything else to crack the case. There should be multiple pathologists working on one case, rather than just having one person. This way, many pathologists can share their opinions and results based on their research and analysis. This would reduce mistakes in an autopsy. Finally, the Crown should read between the lines of the police reports, especially look far into the children's testimonies, since those were inaccurate in Trescott's case. Eyewitnesses are the prime reason for wrongful convictions, so the criminal justice system should improve on always updating a witness report. This will help match the evidence to certain aspects of the crime. Trescott was indeed wrongfully convicted for a crime that he never committed. Spending 10 years in jail will really take a toll on someone's life. That is why we are stressing to get this ISP just right.